Hi, welcome to Roebling Road Raceway, Savannah, Georgia. Beautiful day for racing. I'd like to spend a few minutes today speaking about management, specifically in this case, air management. This is a 1963 Chevrolet Corvette Grand Sport Roadster, built in the early 60s. 650 horsepower, small block Chevrolet engine, Ford Warner Super T10 four-speed synchronized transmission, aluminum Corvette rear differential, Goodyear racing tires, American racing wheels, exhaust headers, all of these things planned, shipped, and installed, hopefully on time and within budget. But if that's all we did, the chances of us realizing our intended goal of taking the checkered flag, winning the race, probably would not happen unless we also take into account the environment in which this vehicle must operate. And in this case, that environment includes the ocean of air in which we all live. Now, in the early 60s, the understanding of aerodynamics was rather rudimentary. But they really tried very hard on this vehicle to minimize the negative effects of the intangible, the air. Let's look at some of the things they did. Chin spoiler forces the air into the grill to cool the radiator. Primary function though in this particular case is at high speed to keep the nose of the car on the ground because the more air that gets under the car, the higher the nose lifts, which can make for a rather unique feeling at 150 or 60 miles an hour. Air exits the engine compartment through these vents, covered wheel wells, vents here, swoopy looking mirrors, you'll notice the cut down windscreen, recessed door handles to get them out of the airflow, flared wheel wells in the rear, a roll bar fared and covered with fiberglass to keep a vacuum from forming behind it, a head fairing behind the pilot's helmet so that the air flows around my head without having a vacuum behind it and flows off the back of the car. Brake cooling ducts here to cool the brakes. Air exits the rear through vents here and here to cool the rear differential. Very rudimentary by today's standards, but in the early 60s, this was pretty heavy duty thinking, right? In an attempt to minimize the negative effects of what most people think of as the intangible, which is the air through which this vehicle must travel. Let me show you what's wrong with some of these things. Unfortunately, the grill opening is much larger than we need to cool the engine. Therefore, we're letting much more air into the car than we really need. The flared wheel wells are nice, except unfortunately they flared it behind the wheel instead of in front of the wheel, which would let air come out because of the vacuum it created. Okay? The air actually gets stuck in here. And at 150 or 60 miles an hour, this is like a giant parachute holding this car back. And you'll notice in the rear, it's nice and smooth, and there's nothing to increase the downforce on this car to give it more traction. Okay. So, not bad, but very rudimentary. Driving this car at full speed is like trying to push a Greyhound bus through the atmosphere when you get up around 150 or 160 miles an hour. Okay. But I think most of you will admit it's kind of a sexy looking vehicle. Now, let me show you another example from the 1990s. This is a 1990 Chevrolet Corvette GT1 Trans Am Coupe race car. Purpose built race car. Now let's see what 1990s thinking did for us. Notice the shape of the front of the car. No ragged edges, nothing to trap the air. The air that hits here pushes down on this lip and actually pushes the car 
into the ground. So as this car goes down the straightaway, the car gets actually lower to the ground, which keeps a minimum amount of air going under the car. We'll come back to that in a minute. Notice that the grill opening to cool the engine is much smaller than mine. We're only letting in enough air to keep the engine operating. When the air escapes, it escapes through these vents here in the wheel well and flow right over the top of the coupe. You notice here this little lip. What this little lip does is cause a little airflow disruption here and a slight vacuum to build up here. This vacuum literally sucks the air out from under the vehicle so that it flows along the side of the vehicle. You'll also notice that there's a valance on the bottom of the car. That keeps the air that's flowing off the car from going under the vehicle and increasing the pressure under the vehicle. As the air flows over the top and along the sides, you'll notice there's a duct here called a NACA duct, N-A-C-A. And what happens is the airflow actually creates a small turbulence here that's low pressure. And it actually sucks the air in to cool the driver. Notice it does not stick out in the airflow the way my brake cooling ducts did. Okay. We come all the way back, ducts here to send air in to do some cooling. Rear wheels and tires covered by the bodywork. And then as the air flows over the car, we come to the most interesting feature. And this is the air dam, or as it is called, a spoiler. And the name spoiler is well chosen. Because although we did everything in the front of the car to increase and make the air flow smooth, we now here are purposely damming up the air. We are spoiling that airflow. And what this does is create a high pressure area right here above the rear axle that pushes down on this car. Okay. In addition, because it's sticking up in the air like this, it creates a small vacuum back here. And you'll notice the shape of the body is curved and expanding. If you looked under this car, you would, it would look like an upside down airplane wing. So this vacuum here is actually sucking the air out from under this vehicle at high speeds, pressing it into the ground. Okay? Now, you might say, what's the big deal? Making the intangible tangible. This car conservatively is four feet wide by six feet long. Right? If you do the math, you'll find out that's approximately 60,000 square inches. Multiply that by 14 pounds per square inch, okay, and you will see that that is a tremendous amount of pressure that's applied to this car just by the air sitting here right now. Okay? But air pressure being like hydraulic pressure operates in every direction. So as long as the air is pressing down, as hard as the air is pressing up, all of this doesn't do us any good. If we could lower the pressure under the car by just a tenth of a pound per square inch, we would have approximately 400 pounds of force pressing down on this car, going down the straightaway. And of course, the swoopier we can make the car and the more effective we could, if we can get it lower than that, just do the math. So that's hundreds of pounds of traction force applied that pushes this car into the ground as it goes down the straightaway. So it hunkers down and in the corners, all of that force pushes these tires into the asphalt so this car can corner at a very high rate of speed. The downside of that is, if in the middle of one of those turns, something unfortunate should happen to this air dam, this vehicle would leave the track at a very high rate of speed in a very ungraceful manner. So you do live on the edge when you start to push the limits of making the intangible tangible. Okay. So let me assure you, we have my car, 650 horsepower, compared to 600 horsepower on this car. My car weighs at least 400 pounds less than this car does. As we go around this racetrack, 
sooner or later, inevitably, this race car will pass my race car because it is using the air to get it where it needs to go, whereas I am merely trying to minimize the negative effects that have been provided.